Hey everyone, and welcome to the Human Design Podcast with me, your host, Emma Dunwoody. I'm a qualified master coach and human behavior specialist, as well as being a qualified human design coach. And I work with clients every single day to answer the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what is my purpose? I also assist them to transition from the person they think they should be to the person they really are on the inside. I teach people how to actually live their design instead of just knowing it. And if this is something that you want to do too, well, stay tuned or reach out for private coaching or human design unpacks where I show you exactly how to live your design. Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Human Design Podcast. There's someone I wanted to introduce you to. That is another one of our incredible uh, sponsors on the program, our Millions of Millionaires mission. That is to make sure that we do everything that we can to support entrepreneurs and small businesses so that they can create the business of their dreams. So the amazing Heather Ivany is here with me. Um, Many of you might have heard of Heather on our podcast. It was an awesome episode. Um, I probably should know the number off my top of my head, but I don't. Uh, I'm sure that's no surprise to you guys. So go check out the podcast. But Heather, welcome to the to the podcast again. Oh, I'm super excited to be back, Emma. Um, Yeah, we have so much fun when we get together, and you have such a brilliant audience. So it's an honor to be back in your company again. Oh, thank you. And you're absolutely right. I'm so grateful for my audience. I really am. They are such a beautiful bunch of humans. I'm really grateful. Now, when you actually, we did a session together, I know that your speciality, although you're a spiritual mentor, you have you know experience with yoga, you have experience with the Akashic Records, you have experience with energy healing. I'm sure there is it there even Reiki in there. Like there's a list. There's a long list. And one of the things that I know now is a real speciality of yours is purpose. So how do you help people with their purpose? Yeah. So um <clears throat> when we talk about purpose, there's sort of three main ways that I look at this. One is our, our, our soul has a timeline, right? And it's connected to higher dimensions in the all-knowing realm. And then our soul is also connected to our incarnated self. So it's got this connection to oneness and it's got this connection to individuality. So if someone really wants to work on their connection to consciousness and be fulfilled with their feeling connected to um, the bigger picture, then that's when I work with the Akashic records with people. I show them how to read their own records. I show them how to read other people's records. And then you can even go into the Akashic records of your business, current events, plants, animals, anything that has a consciousness has a record connection connected to it. And then if someone is more um, honing in on like, what is the purpose in this particular lifetime that I'm in? So their incarnated purpose, I work with a program called Unlocking You. It's also a three month long program, same as the Akashic training, but this one's designed specifically to help keep people from being distracted by the periphery, give them tools to hone into their midline and then amplify their purpose and help them to fulfill it in this lifetime. Oh my goodness. That sounds so exciting, far out. And so what, what do they learn? Are they, they, is it Akashic Records? What else do they learn in that program? Yeah, so the Unlocking You program. So what I've done with that one is I've taken sort of the 25 years of teaching yoga and I've taught multiple different types of teacher training programs. But what I did is I, I pulled from the philosophy of the wisdom of, of these thousands of years of yoga and pulled out like, what are the tools that everyone can benefit from if they want to be more connected to themselves? So We work with intention that is like more powerful than just um, an affirmation or wishful thinking. I show people how to really hone in on how to work with intention at certain times a day. So it's more amplified. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And then phrase it into like a positive I am statement because I am state I am is the language of the universe and it's the language of present moment. So those two points bring us into um, a very amplified experience of intention. Mm. And then inevitably when someone's wanting to shift and change and transform, resistance is gonna show up. 
So we, I show um, individuals how resistance is actually your ally and not your enemy and how to work with it to create opportunity and change. We create boundaries because most people have really strong boundaries with other people, but maybe not with themselves or they have it with the human dimension, but they don't have it with the energetic dimension. So we work with boundaries in those three ways. And then we also play with meditation in a form that is personalized to the individu individuals that I'm working with. Um, Cause meditation can be for some people just walking barefoot in nature. And for others, it's like a 40 minute transcendent experience. So I just let it be very personalized. I love and then that. rest is the final element because we get so excited in this human form that we forget that it requires rest and cup filling and nourishment. So I work with Yoga Nidra to show people how to amplify the rest space. Wow. I love all of that. And as you were talking through, like so much of that resonates as well. You know, um, I love how you are making it sort of unique to the each individual that's part of the group. So can you share the sort of results that people are getting? I know that for me personally, when we had our session together, I was blown away. Like I was blown away at what you, what was shared with me and what the results that I got is that instant, like, oh my God, I can trust this. I can really trust this subtle energy that I get this feeling, this knowing, you know, keep going. Um, so for me, it was really profound in that place. Are there other results that you might be able to share some other stories? Yeah. So sticking with the Unlocking You program, um, oftentimes when people start to really hone in on themselves and their aligned purpose, they become more confident and courageous to make changes in their life. So I've had um, individuals go from, she, one woman was an accountant that um, eventually moved into doing, um, uh, becoming a doula for, for palliative care, which is beautiful. Yeah, wow. Uh, I've had individuals, one woman went, she's a clinical psychologist and she moved from um, working in sort of a, a system-based um, employee situation to being able to branch out on her own and create her own private practice. And then in that she offers Akashic sessions within her counseling session. So it gave her more freedom to express um, her healing energies in the way that she felt more authentic to herself. I love that. Um, so those are some of the results with the Unlocking You. And then what's most fun with the Akashic training is people get really nervous before it starts thinking, oh, what if I can't do this? Or what if I can't read someone else's records? Um, I've never had anyone go through that isn't able to read the records by the time we're done. And so that alone is mind blowing because a lot of people think when they're in sessions, healing sessions, they think that it's some sort of a gift that someone has that makes them able to be able to work with energy in the way that they do. And honestly, it's, it's a skill set that just needs to be honed in on and practiced mm. and consistently practiced and it's curated and sort of pulled out from the individual and expressed. So I love those transformations. And then the third signature program that I have is called Sovereign Leadership. And this is working with um, the energetic realm <clears throat> to support the entrepreneur that wants to amplify their income. So I've seen people go from 5xing to 10xing their income per month just working oh, I love with that yeah the resources that are around them yeah yeah oh my goodness that sounds oh, I feel like I want to sign up to all of them I, I I'm just I'm all in with with you Heather you've been such such an incredible person to work with um I'm also like I really want to have a session and let's look at my business's Akashic records that sounds so exciting so <laughs> How can people get in contact? Obviously, we're going to put all the links in the show notes, but how can people find you? Yeah, the best way is just to go to my website. And it's simply my name, heatherivany.com. That's the easiest way. All of my programs are on the homepage there under the little tab offering. Um, most of them start in September, end of September, early October. And they'll repeat in the new year as well if, if it feels a little bit too rushed for anyone starting soon. Um, I also have a retreat in November um, in Cellulita. So this is for the individual that has done a lot of the growth work and just wants to be in the experience. So it's called Harmonize and it's working with nature. It's working with um, 
body movement, meditation, Akashic, fire ceremonies. You don't have to be an expert in any of them. You just have to have a willingness and a desire to want to attune and harmonize to your own heart song. So that's in November. And wow. then the other way people can get in touch with me would be through Instagram. Um, and it's just my name, Heather underscore Ivany. So yeah. Oh, amazing. Well, people, you have to go and check out all of these programs. The retreat sounds amazing too. I feel like I want to go on every single retreat that I speak to, like all the people in my world. And I want to go there. I want to be on all of them. Mm. Um, so if you, if this has lit your fire, if you're excited, if you're curious, if you're a little bit obsessed with Heather, like I am, go and check out the show notes and find the program that's going to suit you. Thanks everybody. Thanks Heather. I am so excited to share this episode with you. Um, today I am talking to someone who has been influencing and impacting my uh, entrepreneurial career for over a decade. I actually came across Lisa Messenger a couple of times, but really started to fall in love with this human being when she launched this incredible magazine uh, called Collective Hub as a print magazine in 2013. She had no experience in an industry that people said was either dying or dead. And Collective Hub has since grown into an international multimedia business and lifestyle platform with multiple verticals across print, digital, events, and most recently, co-working spaces all of which are serving to ignite human potential. This woman is such an inspiring human. She is so down to earth, uh, vulnerable, honest, and at the same time, she's had such a massive global impact. I mean, she's done work with Richard Branson and he has personally invited her to facilitate um, with him and do a number of really awesome things. Lisa is also an international speaker, best-selling author, and an authority on disruption in both the corporate sector and the startup scene. I've been doing her startup smart, even though my business is way past startup, because I just wanted to work with her. I just wanted to have this experience of being in the same room as her. And I tell you what, it is awesome to the point where this structure of startup smart actually um, has really helped and inspired my eldest son. I'm like, right, when you're ready to start your business, you just have to follow these steps. They're just beautiful. So Go and check her out. Obviously, all the links are going to be in the show notes. And in today's conversation, we talk all about her human design, as well as this journey that she has been on as an entrepreneur, but also as a human. She's going to share some pretty vulnerable, raw, honest um, things with you guys. Her and her partner have been through, I think it's 16 or 17 rounds of IVF, um, unsuccessful rounds. So she really talks truth, honesty. Uh, no wonder I'm completely drawn to her because she's totally my people. Honest, tells the story as it is. Um, she's one of the great Instagram. Um, I don't want. I don't even want to call Lisa an influencer, but you know, like she's going to call it as she sees it. I even when I was signing up for a program, I reached out in her DMs, and she came back to me. And I think these sort of things, I know for me being an entrepreneur, it's important for me that I'm that person, that it is me at the other end. Um, and yeah, well, enough just fangirling about the most incredible human or one of the most incredible humans. This is the completion of my trifecta, the three women that have inspired me the most within my entrepreneurial journey. And that's Lisa Messenger, Francisca Asili, um, and of course, the amazing Denise Duffield Thomas. So if you don't know any of these women, they're all Aussies. They're all smashing it. Well, actually, Francisca is what she calls a Swazi. She's a Swiss Australian. Um, and yeah, please enjoy the episode. And I look forward to hearing what you think. Hey, hey, everyone. And welcome to today's podcast. Now, today I am super excited because this makes up the trio of women that I have been inspired by every day since I started my entrepreneurial journey. So today, welcome Lisa Messenger to the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's beautiful to be here with you. 
I am so, so excited to have you. As I said, like there's um, three women that I've really followed for such a long time since I transitioned out of my advertising career and into entrepreneurial world. Um, yourself, Francisca Astilli. I don't know if you know Francisca. She's got an incredible business called uh, Basic Bananas. And um, Denise Duffield Thomas. And I've had them both on the podcast. So it's so beautiful to have you here because you've been oh. such a massive impact on my journey. So thank you at the outset. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know Denise quite well from over the years and yeah, amazing women as well. So thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. One of the things I really love about all three of you, but specifically you, is that you really, in fact, all of you, you dive in and you kind of make a mess. And that's kind of been become one of my part of my brand as well you know not afraid I'm always talking about we're either winning or learning you know there's only there's no such thing as failure only feedback and I feel like this is such a huge part of your story like you you know fail fast is your motto have you always been that way because and I want to get into one of the other things you talk about really early on oh my god guys I've got super excited I've jumped ahead and I wanted to mention <laughs> that I am actually doing Lisa's Startup Smart um, business program, and it has been fantastic. And although my business isn't a startup, we're going to the next level. We'll probably, I'd say we're going to hit seven figures this year, which is super, super exciting. One of the things that I think is so great about this program is the way you set it out is step by step. And all I can see is like, not only is this going to serve me, but my kids who, of course, two parents that are entrepreneurs, this program is so powerful to just, you know, like the, the framework to step into entrepreneurhood, um, which is so cool. I will come thank back to that. That, that. And thank you for that because you're part of the first cohort, as you know, and we can talk about, you know, failing and second guessing and imposter syndrome and all those things. But, you know, you put something or I put something out into the world and hope that we've done, you know, everything right and that it's going to land well. So it's really beautiful to hear that. So thank you. Mm, you're so, so welcome. Um, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit, but I really want to dive into, oh, for those of you listening as well, Lisa is an emotional generator for six profile. So with the four, six profile, Lisa, one of the things about the line six, this is the role model. Okay. So you go through three very significant phases in your life up until the age of 30, you're in this trial and error. So everything is about, you know, winning or feedback, you know, that that's kind of how you roll. And then you go into this next phase, which is between 30 and 50. Um, in human design, we call it on the roof. But what you're really doing is you're creating wisdom from all of these experiences and you're kind of like, um, you know, throwing out what doesn't work. You're having a look at what everyone else is doing. And then you're like, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. And you really um, sort of nuance things. And then after 50, um, then you're going to become like, you're already impactful, but wait till then, you know, like this is when <laughs> the role model really steps into the power. So I'm really curious about this piece because I know in my entrepreneurial journey, um, one of the things that saved my life was it was Renegade Collective in the beginning and then the oh. Collective Hub magazine because all of a sudden I didn't feel alone. I felt like, oh, my God, there's all these people that are going on this entrepreneurial journey. It's not just me. They're talking my language and I felt like I was a part of it. What I'm really curious about is you're really good at failing fast, making mistakes, and you, you seem to be really resilient. Were you always like that or was it something that you, a muscle that you built over time? It is such a great question and I'm looking forward to diving into this six and beings, but also so much of what you just said resonated so deeply with me. I love it when when I connect with someone on a podcast and it actually is a beautiful deep connection. So thank you for really, you know, going into all these spaces. And I feel like this is going to be a really juicy conversation. So to answer your question, no, I think it for me definitely has been, been a learned muscle over time. And it is only through multiple failures, <laughs> testing, iterating, you know, finding a different way that I've actually learned the resilience piece. And I think that's really important for people to know, because when I started my entrepreneurial journey, for example, um, was 21 years ago, I started my first business, October 22nd, 2001. And, awesome. you know, back then, 
things, and I use this example sometimes, all I remember is the figure. I remember a figure of $80. I can't remember if someone owed it to me or if I owed it to someone, but I remember the feeling associated with it because there was this scarcity thing about, oh my gosh, it's a lot, or I'm not going to get it, or I'm not going to be able to pay it. I can't remember exactly, but I remember deeply that feeling. And the thing about that is, everyone's journey is unique. And what affected me back then is very different. Now it might be an 80,000 or an 800,000. Sometimes I'm playing a much bigger game. The numbers don't matter, right? But what happened was I, over the years, I've learned to push the boundaries a bit. I've learned to get comfortable with um, being uncomfortable and with failing. And I've learned to flip it and um, turn it into something else and take the lessons learned. Now, you said before failing fast, which I talk about a lot, because I feel like there are too many of us, there used to be me, where we don't want to put something out into the world until it's perfect. And there's that saying, you know, done is better than perfect. And I can absolutely testify to that and so continuously I'm testing things and when I say I'm failing I mean I fail at least 30 times a day I would say but what I mean by that is you'll often see for anyone following me on social media which is Lisa Messenger you'll see I'll put something out there to test something and then if there if it's like crickets no one responds I'm like oh okay that's not going to work so we're actually fortunate in a way in this day and age that there is that real-time feedback loop and we can you know fail and iterate continuously and I'm constantly doing it you know because I'm constantly pushing myself and my boundaries and as you already know we're expanding in a fairly major way into the US at the moment and that does not come without you know multiple issues but I think what we get better at as entrepreneurs and people who are, you know, become better at failing is we're great at problem solving and we're great at finding solutions where other people just see problems. And I think that is a learned skill and it only comes by pushing yourself and going, oh, okay, I didn't fall in a heap or, you know, I actually got through that. I'm going to push it a little bit more and push it a little bit more. So I would say I'm probably, well, everyone says around me, I'm one of the most risk adverse people like I love risk and I push it pretty hard but I always ask myself the question how much am I prepared to lose and I think that's really important because nothing is fail safe yeah yeah oh my god I love that and one of the things I love about what you said is that you are constantly putting things out there to fail fast but you're not taking the feedback personally and I think that this is one of the biggest things like one of the books that I I mean there's hundreds of books that I'm always banging on about, but one in particular is the four agreements and this particular agreement about not taking things personally, because I think this is where so many entrepreneurs lose their way is that they take all the feedback personally um, and they make it about themselves. And, and one of the things that, that the first things that you teach us as well is this, this place where, or this, um, this, belief is like to 100% back yourself, believe in yourself. And again, like, I'd really love to hear your journey on that because I know for me, my story, and you you probably don't know my story, my listeners obviously do, but um, at 28, I was diagnosed with depression and panic disorder. Um, I was given this diagnosis and told I was going to be able to manage it, but I'd never heal it. And in that moment, that was a defining moment for me because I was like, well, I I wasn't. The choice was I'm either not going to live or I'm going to find a way to heal myself. And that was the catalyst for who I am today and the business that I create, because it's all about giving the power back to the people. And gratefully for me in that moment, I had that, I'm going to back this feeling that I feel in my gut that says, actually, this is going to be a path to you um, healing. And there's so much more coming from it. So I would really love to hear your journey around uh, learning to really, accept yourself, trust yourself, back yourself, because it's something all of us have to learn to do because unfortunately our conditioning doesn't give us the space to learn it from the moment we pop out and each generation's getting better and better. But I'd love to hear your story on building that real um, confidence in your being. Mm, Thank you. And thank you for sharing um, that piece about you. I don't know you well enough yet. And so it's nice to hear some of your journey and I really appreciate that. Um, so 
And I think when we allow ourselves to be courageous enough to dig into, in your case, you know, depression and other things that you are diagnosed with and really look at that and, and use that as a catalyst to go on a journey, as it sounds like you have done, um, that I have personally learned is where the power and the resilience and the courage, um, you know, comes from essentially. So my journey um, was very much around, I mean, it, it's always nice to see, you know, where I am now, but if I dig back, really, I've been through a lot. So um, in my 20s, I was drinking way too much and I ended up um, identifying as an alcoholic, which back then was like, you know, to mainstream society. I love, I have behind me um, this weekend, Stella magazine and the entire magazine was on, you know, big, you know, sober, being a new cool movement. And I was like, well, it certainly wasn't that when I identified. And back then it was just seen as, you know, old men who were like in the streets. And so it was a fairly confronting situation for me. And um, I kind of, like you but parallel but different obviously I was kind of like well I can continue to spiral you know and hit rock bottom in my case I was extraordinarily lost and spent a lot of my 20s very suicidal um or I can you know get courageous enough to do something about it and I was lucky I sought some help someone sent me to an AA meeting and I kind of went along to that for the first year I think nearly every day and that changed the trajectory of my life. And it was not just about putting down the alcohol. It was then about doing the real work. You know, the alcohol for me was just a crutch that I was using to escape into and to numb out and to self-sabotage, keep myself small. So then I had to start the work on like, well, what are the triggers and where is this coming from? And, you know, what is everything? So, yeah, then I continued on for many, many years to kind of work on that. And it's, you know, a continuous <laughs> work in progress. Um, but I've now been sober for 17 and a half years. So, yeah, which is amazing, I think. <laughs> and there's been many, many yeah. other points in my journey which have been I mean I've been through a divorce I've been through horrible breakups my dad died four years ago like I've had so much unexpected adversity and I feel like you know I often say we can't control what comes at us we just can't you know who saw a pandemic coming who saw you know a multitude of other things coming but what we can control um, or learn to control is our mindset and how we respond and I choose that word consciously um, respond as opposed to react because there are just so many things that come at us you know and so I've learned to sort of have a mindset flip into an attitude of gratitude not always easy for sure in the moment yeah I mean and sometimes you just think oh my goodness will this stop you know but I think we have to train ourselves to be able to live in that space otherwise things would absolutely cripple us I mean just to quickly yeah. give some more context you know this I think your listeners probably won't I've just been through 16 rounds of IVF I think I hold a record um you know yeah. simultaneously we're trying to do a renovation which has been nothing short of a disaster <laughs> um and there's been multiple other things right um my fiance's dad passed away suddenly relatively recently so it's like boom 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 yet despite all of that I choose to put goodness into the world and I've learned several different tools to go holy shit I feel like everything is falling apart but how do I pull myself out of it and it's been tough you know because a lot has been coming fairly consistently for a little while but yeah. I need to keep reframing 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 yeah I love that and one of the things that really drew you me to you in the first place was you could just tell that you'd done so much of the work done so much of that inner work and really face those parts of yourself that you know you'd put in the shadow cupboard you know like I don't want anyone seeing that stuff let's just hide that away um, and it's so much easier when it's out and I think that is the beautiful thing in a way about 2022 like globally we're starting to have 
bigger conversations and you know be more inclusive and accepting and non-judgmental and you know normalizing to an extent mental health and things like that so I always think like a lot of people and I don't know if this is with you but people will say oh my gosh you're so courageous for sharing that or thank you and I'm like well actually makes me feel a hell of a lot better having it out than in yeah 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 I love that and I think it's so powerful you know this I mean through the frame of human design we're always talking about authenticity because basically the purpose of of human design if we really sort of um, pull it back it's getting us out of the mind into the body listening to our own wisdom as opposed to making decisions that are incorrect via our conditioning um, and then going out into the world and having the impact that our soul came here to have and what's so beautiful about what you're talking about is you're just speaking your design I mean you're um, and you won't understand this language so don't worry about it but I know I feel like that I'm the perpetual seeker. I'm like, I need to learn all of this. Teach me. Yeah, yeah. And and you'll love it because so much of your design is actually what you're talking about. And you actually have a thing. It's called the incarnation cross. And your incarnation cross was once described um, as the, the job description of your aura. So you can't think your way there, but it's kind of a large, it's a large way of how you impact the world. And for you, you actually have the cross of service and your highest energy within that is all about, it's called the gate of the joyous. And what it is, is it goes, it's shadow state is like dissatisfaction. It's a restlessness. It's basically like that stress that you live in when you're going around and around in fear circles. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it, it triggers this self-development. This triggers this, well, I'm going to go out in the world to change myself and as you go out in the world to change yourself of course you go full circle and come back inside and go oh hang on the joy's in here and once the joy is found in here you then go out into the world and through service you have your impact that way so I love it because it, you're, you're speaking I often say you speak your design we all do it mm. um, and, and I just think it's so yeah it's so beautiful um, now one of the things that like the other line you have in the profile is the line four and the line four is actually, um, it's called the opportunist, but what it's all about is your people. Um, and it's, you're on the earth to influence the way other people feel about others. So these are really, really influential people. These are people who they create, they, they take in the wisdom, you know, people that have, you know, learned through natural talent, learned through knowledge, learned through experience. And then you take all of these ideas or experiences or knowledge and you literally infect your community. So it's so important that you're with the right people. And community is something that I've seen you create over and over and over again. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about Collective Hub, the magazine, because this was something for me, as I said, it was a massive lifeline. And to this day, and we've just unpacked because we actually now live really close to you because we've moved to Byron. We were in Balmain and then we moved to Byron. So it's kind of like, wow, talk about parallels. <laughs> um, but one of the, the really cool things is as I was unpacking, I'm literally finding all of these sheets from that I've ripped out of the magazine and I've put into, I call it my vision folder or I've stuck it on something and, you know, it was, it's always, it was such an inspiration. So what drove you to create a print magazine in an environment where everyone was saying you couldn't do it? Like what I really want to know about is, because you kind of, you, you speak to and you, I don't think you allude, you do speak to like this intuition, like trusting your gut. Like mm -hmm. I'd love to know a lot about how you make that decision when it's everyone else is telling you one thing, but you're like, mm, no, no, I'm just going to go and do it anyway. Could you talk a little bit to that? Because I feel like the context for me is that my work really helps people to take their power back and start making better decisions for themselves and create something that's aligned for them. And in that process, it's really challenging because everyone else is telling them what to do. So I'd really love to hear, um, and I'm always talking about people becoming their own guru. Like I'm not the guru. I'm going to give you everything you need so that you can be your own guru. So tell us a little bit about that decision and your intuition. Like, how did you trust yourself through that process? And of course, it became super successful. Then you ended up shutting it down. And now it's coming back. Oh, my God, I'm so <laughs> excited. So tell us a little bit about that through the frame of intuition and gut. Mm, I will. And also, yeah, I want to know more about this whole human design because so many words that you just said around my numbers, like 
joy. Joy is my, I say, my purest essence. Um, when I'm in service, I am absolutely 100% unquestionably in flow. We can talk about flow state. Yeah, there's a lot of words that you said. I was like, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. crazy. You cannot make this stuff up. And my background, yeah. so I'm actually a behavioral coach. I'm certified in all the profiling tools. You know, I've worked with C-level execs for years, run workshops. And then when I came across this, a large part of my journey was actually like, oh my God, this is too woo. I can't share it with people. Um, yeah, but I yeah, started yeah. using it with my C-levels and all the change, like everything was magnified hundred percent. So yeah, it's really powerful stuff. But Ooh. back to you, this is about you. <laughs> no, it's powerful. I love it because that will, yeah, that's the learner in me wanting to always seek and learn and do better and be better. Um, so the intuitive part, and I mean, that with the magazine, that's probably just one of, many times it's played out for me um I mean now it's now I'm pretty in sync with that but probably until 2013 and that's when I say I truly stepped into my purpose unquestionably that's when I launched the magazine and yeah it, and it's interesting to unpack it and I've written um a book called Purpose, which is probably the most aligned with how that actually came about. So I'll try and summarize the 208 pages. <laughs> but right. I think for me, um, there's a few things. One, um, by that point, I'd had my businesses for nearly 12 years. And I felt like I was comfortable. I was making good money by then. But I wasn't juiced up. I didn't feel on fire. So that's one thing if anyone's kind of listening to like, how do you get into this kind of flow state or this intuitive state? And so I was getting, and you said this before, which is interesting, antsy and like, what's next? I got to go out into the world. And thanks yeah. so much of what you said. So that happened. And then the second part was, um, so yeah, I was too comfortable. So I was kind of bored. The second piece was, as an entrepreneur and um, an innovative thinker and sort of an inquirer and a bit of a thought leader, I was surrounded by all these amazing people, but we were all having um, these covert conversations behind closed doors like, oh, so Emma, tell me about how your supply chain works or how much money you're making over here or how do you make that work? And it was all these closed conversations. And in the media, the mainstream media, Everyone was just talking about, oh, Emma, Emma's amazing. She's done this. And I was always left scratching my head going, but how, but how, but why, but why? I don't understand. And so the second piece was I just want to tell these stories. I want to, you know, dig in. And this was very gut feel. So it was a combination of kind of being pissed off and over myself and like too comfortable and just wanting change. And the second piece was, I'm frustrated as well because I can't understand how these people are doing it and why are we all having conversations behind closed doors and why aren't people telling the real story behind the story? And you'll hear me say a lot, which has been in Collective's DNA since 2013, the raw, the real, the relatable and the attainable. Like why can't we tell something so that people could suddenly be like, oh, I get it. Oh, okay. I can do that. So the relatable and attainable piece has always been really important to me. I've never been interested in telling anyone's story unless they get to the guts of it. And um, <laughs> I remember a company came to me once and said, here are all our beautiful water filters. Like a publicist turned up to my office and had like 27 water filters. And I just said, oh my God, stop. Let's just agree they're a great water filter. Put them away. What is the story? And she was like, oh, there was this Italian man and he had a granddaughter and this happened. And, and I was like, okay, boom, you've got me. Tell me how this happens. What is the story? What do you stand for? So that was my kind of like totally ill thought out, no strategy. There was just this inner knowing within me. I was like, I need to tell these stories. And my naivety coupled with some business acumen from the previous years was actually perfect because as you so rightly said, 
it was a highly saturated market at the time there were five and a half thousand print mags in Australia but also people said print was dead or dying and why would I be so stupid and also I'd never worked in the media or in magazines <laughs> so it was like boom 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 but now when I you know, teach people or talk to wannabe entrepreneurs, I always say a saturated market is actually an amazing place to be because it I means it means that there is there are people already wanting and willing to buy it. So if you can put your own unique spin on it, and you talked a little about this before, taking lots of different ideas, I call it synthesizing. If you can pull on lots of different things, and when I do this, I look anywhere but the genre I'm working in. So I did not look at another magazine. I didn't look at any other business things. I actually looked at kids and I looked at design and I looked at fashion and I looked anywhere but the thing I was going into for inspiration. And I don't know, Em, I just had this unshakable, like inner knowing that this is where I had to be. Like it was unquestionable. And the thing about that is, and I talk about this a lot, when we allow ourselves to arrive at that space, the synchronicity and the serendipity and what actually is attracted is actually insane. And this is where I go a bit woo-woo because if I was trying to control that, there is no freaking way on the planet if it was left up to me because I didn't have any skills for it really. And everything was stacked against me. But because I felt it in every single cell in my body, it's like if you know your why, the universe has a way of, you know, bringing the how, I think. And yeah. that's just what I did. And it just freaking started. And, I mean, you know, the journey and that's well documented. I've written many books about it and done many interviews. But that print mag was in 37 countries as a physical print magazine within 18 months. So it just exploded and that wasn't me that was just me believing so strongly and then handing it over yeah oh my god I'm working, I I'm working my ass off I yeah it yeah. takes a lot of hard work as well yeah, yeah oh my god I love it and now I just have to geek out a bit human design wise so your type as a generator we talk about the container and you've used and for those listening did you hear all the words did you hear the words Lisa used um one of the things that the first thing to understand about purpose is our type is our container. So all the details is so many details that go into that container, but as a generator, you are on the planet to do the work that lights you up. So through the frame of human design, that moment in time where you were feeling frustrated, which is actually what we call the not self of a generator frustration. It's, it's that, that basically that indicator that tells us we're out of alignment and I'm a manifesting generator. So I'm half generator, if you like. Um, and we get stuck on those plateaus. We get stuck on those plateaus where we, we feel like really, um, you know, like, like nothing's happening. And oftentimes we do really, um, you know, that's when we'll self-sabotage. But for you, I love it because you're like, no, no, I want to go back into a growth stage. Obviously, that's not what the mind was thinking, but that's what the body wisdom was saying. Like, no, we're ready for a growth phase. One of the big things and that, that when you talk about serendipity and um, synchronicity and all of those things is, we have through the frame of HD, we talk about strategy and authority. You actually have um, like all three of what we call the awareness centers. So um, the solar plexus, the spleen and the, the uh, ajna, which basically means you've got mental awareness, you've got um, like body awareness and you've got emotional awareness, which means you just have, you you literally are completely tapped in. You have all the, this awareness that you're not, not even conscious of. And when you're actually in response, this is the, the key to the generator is that we're actually not designed to initiate per se. We're not meant to take an idea and then just put it into action. And even the way you talk about um, when you have an idea, you just throw it out on Instagram and see if something happens. Like, that's awesome because you're not actually putting it into, into action. You're just like kind of sharing your ideas and then people will say it's a yes or a no and you've got something to respond to. That's, that's like, okay, green light from the universe. Um, so, <clears throat> so much of that story is like, you really are trusting the communication that's coming in through your body and, um, you know, from the universe and having emotional authority. What's really interesting is you have, every time I go to look at your chart, my internet goes funny. So I can't look at it. I have to just go from memory, <laughs> but you have this, this configuration that can be a little bit challenging where you have the gate um, in your design, which is the 34. It's the power of the great. It's the, the most powerful. It's really busy. It's multitasking. It's go, go, go. It's got all this energy. 
but you have emotional authority and emotional authority is someone that has to say, and I have emotional authority. Um, it's someone that has to say, I'll tell you tomorrow. I'll tell you, like, I'll come back to you. Um, they don't, you know, being right in the now and being spontaneous can sometimes turn and bite them in the ass. Whereas if we just wait a moment or a day, um, what's going to happen is we're going to notice things come into our aura or our awareness. And they're just like, they're percolating, they're percolating, but there's this feeling in us, like, I think it's a yes, but it's just a not yet. Um, and when the emotional authority can actually, when we can let it wait until we get that, that green light, then we get like the fast track from where, from here to there, we get to quantum leap from here to there. Um, but sometimes, especially because you also have what we call a defined sacral, it means that you also have this part of your energy that's in every single moment. It's going, yep, no, I have energy for this. I don't have energy for this. So it's really quick in the moment. And you have splenic awareness, a defined spleen, which means your intuition is plugged in all the time. And that's very spontaneous. So there's this balance within you between fast and slow and it's really learning to navigate that journey is incredibly powerful because when you let yourself just have a little bit more time and sometimes, you know, like my kids know this about me gratefully now. So they'll mm -hmm. ask me something and they'll say, I'll, um, let me know. And that let me know might be 30 seconds because there's enough of window on, or it might be the next day. And it just means that we're more aligned to the decisions that we make. Does any of that resonate with you? So much. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is like the most perfect podcast. I feel like I'm learning so much more than I can possibly give. That's so good. It's, it's really interesting as well because, um, because so for those listening now who don't know a lot about me, at the moment we're putting out between 40 and 60 products a year, so books, journals, affirmation cards. Um, every single one of those ideas, bar none, comes through me. And so literally I will be like, oh, the, like it just comes to me and I'm like, we've got to do this. And what's interesting about that is, I have to work really cleverly with my team because it's a big team and we have, you know, I have writers and sub-editors and proofreaders and like designers and then a whole lot of logistics and, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole sort of chain that it goes through. But so they know me quite well for coming up with, oh, we have to do this. And, uh, and it might be that, you know, like for example, all of 2023 product is mapped within an inch of its life. But today, for example, I was like, no, we need to do this in here and this in here. And I will have already like boom, 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 I've appointed writers or I've appointed people because it's all intuition. And it's, um, yeah, and it's interesting because that piece, I think some of my team are like, how do you keep coming up with the ideas? And mostly they work, some of them not so much, but I'm always like, I just, I just know, I just got to do this one. So it can be probably a little annoying for my detail oriented, <laughs> you know, precision team, but it's also what makes me good at what I do is it's just the gut and it's like, I got to trust, I got to trust. So it comes very much through me. A lot of it is not conscious decision sometimes I may put it through a bit of a test of you know is that on trend is there a market you know readiness you know blah 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 but mostly it's just like I gotta do this yeah. oh my god I love it it and I just for the for the people playing along at home um you have two <laughs> channels that are both in individual circuitry one of them it's called um freak to genius so it's this person and, and I actually have part, half of it and so it's this person that can take in all these massive ideas. You also have a gate that you're going to love this. It's called um, the, the gate of the mystery. It's actually like the universal why. It's the, the kid that, that will always goes, yeah, but why? But why? But why? Oh, that but why? is and me you, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you totally have this. But this <laughs> channel is all about, you know, you go from genius to freak or freak to genius. And how this happens is that you have this ability to take in all these huge concepts and then through this channel, you can decipher them down into exactly the simplicity of how they can be received. Um, and if you don't take the time to allow that to drop in, then people perceive you as the freak. But if you like, 
and, and I think this is a large part of what you've done in business. I love even the example that you gave about the water filter people. Like you know what's superfluous. You know what's needed in a simple way for people to receive that message. Mm. You also have this other channel that's super cool that you're talking to. It's the 214. It's all about your direction. And when you do you, the resources and the money just turn up. But the moment you slip into doing something someone else's way, that's when you it's like you you unplug from from that natural flow. Mm. I call it through, I call it walking like being in flow state where it's even when even when things are difficult, they're kind of easy, things just open, or it's like walking through mud. And that's when I'm trying to control something or I think I know what the outcome should be. And I keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's like no matter how much my um, logical brain says no, but this is right, if it's not right for me, it's like every um, barrier and obstacle will arise. And I find that comical after so many years in business. I'm like, but I know how to do this. But it's like that is some universal, I'm sure yeah. you have wording for it, thing at play where it's just like, no, nope, the supply chain is not working. The factory is not getting the right tooling or the right like all the things yeah, you know, will fall apart. Yeah. 100%. And it's because you have a defined Ajna, which means that your thinking is a gift to the world, but it's a gift to the world. We call it your outer authority. The moment you try to use it to make decisions for you, that's when it all goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's that you, your decisions come from the body, from that knowing. It's so cool. A couple of things I want to talk about. One thing, and this is something that I'm sort of curious about. Now, I don't know if you see this um, in in the world, because I'm a coach, obviously in the world of coach or coaching or human design or whatever it is, um, there is this ethos at the moment where a lot of people are sort of talking about, um, you know, like I can teach you how to make $10,000 a month. And it's very money orientated. It's very focused on the money. And one thing I know in my journey, and I've done lots of deconditioning around money and the greatest lesson I've ever learned is to stop trying to do it everybody else's way and come back to myself and discover what's true for me. What advice would you give to people who are, let's say they're either transitioning or they've transitioned out of the corporate world into the entrepreneurial space? They, of course, need to make money. Um, But what would your advice, what's the best way to go when it comes to, you know, actually that transition and becoming self-sustainable? So money. (laughs) <laughs> I wrote a I wrote a book in 2015. Got it. About money and mindfulness. <laughs> Got it. And, done it. In fact, I bought the workbook too. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It's probably one of my favorite books that I've written because um, because when Collective Hub really took off, so many people said to me, "Oh my gosh, well, you must have had all this money," and I said, "No, I did not." And I I really started that book by saying that I could not care less about money for money's sake. Um, I care about it as a vehicle for freedom and choice. But if we start with, you know, money as the end goal, we're very likely to not succeed. So um, I like to measure now, you know, let's rather make a billion dollars, let's impact a billion people or, you know, whatever your figure again is. Because I really believe, again, you know, once you're in flow state, once you're really do stuff about something once you're where you should be you can package that in better languaging for this but um the money just tends to flow now to answer your question which we've been covering a little bit in the course um haven't we that i think it's often tricky when you're used to a certain you know paycheck way of living it's easy and I know a lot of people who are doing the course at the moment and someone I actually spoke to today my old um my who was my marketing director for six and a half years and she's now working in a senior job and so often you hear oh but I'm on this great money or I just got this um you know my title's better now I just got a promotion like I've got to pay my mortgage I think there is always going to be a myriad of excuses that will keep us in the thing that is safe and I think you know for, so the people so for the people who are in that space you are not alone this is a thing I hear all day every day and probably you do as well Em the trick is to find a way to bridge that so that you're not being silly you know we still need to be financially astute in some way 
but is there a way that you can start to you know test your idea as a side hustle because any one of us can do that you know in um you know in a minimal viable way something that's not going to break the bank you know can you start on social media or, or a blog or something just talking about the subject and seeing if it resonates with people is there a market you know do you have the time and space on the side if you're going into a service driven business or idea to actually see well would someone actually pay me to do this and you know so there are ways that you can sort of test and build your confidence and that resilience piece and that ability to take little risks um, that you know hopefully help you to be actually able to transition into doing what you love while still retaining some of the financial security and I would hope in this day and age where it's more like you know flexible workplaces hybrid workplaces you know that people are more flexible and I think generally if you have an understanding boss or employer if you say I, I really I'd love to drop back to four days a week or can I do something else if you're courageous enough to have that conversation sometimes it gives you the opportunity to have the time and space to try and create and the trick around that is to actually have boundaries and actually create the time and space and honor that for yourself because it's easy to get busy and we all glorify the act of being busy I'm so busy I'm so busy so you know I think it's really important to you know really follow what is your dream what is your true purpose what is your calling what is that thing inside of you that makes you feel alive and, and lights you up and when you reach it there is nothing better I think so it's about really I think being courageous enough to sever the ties from but oh, I earn so much money here because in my experience and in the my experience about all the people that I've witnessed who've taken that jump if they truly are doing something that their heart you know connect that connects with them at a heart and soul level then the money will come it will yeah I love that and that's that is exactly my experience you know when I was um I actually started with a, another business it was actually a nanny agency of all things um <laughs> and oh my god I couldn't stand it I couldn't stand <laughs> it it was so bad and of course it didn't succeed um but through that process it was you know again it showed me what I am good at and I was good with the, with um the people and you know, I'd been going through a challenge in my marriage and we'd sort of healed that. And I'm like, oh, hang on a second. I think this like personal development thing is a good thing. I think I should go down there. And that's when I actually went and certified as a master coach. Um, but what I love, you said something really powerful and I really want the listeners to hear. Um, I mean, you said lots of powerful things, but there's just one thing that really stood out. That choice that we have to have the courageous um, conversations you know when we're transitioning we often time and I know when I was in advertising like you would never say those sort of things to your boss but we are post pandemic now and there are, we live in a completely new world whether we did or we didn't I think the art of learning how to have courageous conversations is something as an entrepreneur it will be an absolute game changer you know yeah. one of the things I love that you always talk about is like um, you are courageous enough or brave enough to sit at a table and ask all the questions that you want to ask. And I know for me growing up, I was always afraid to ask questions, you know, yeah. and I would hear it in my head, like, don't ask a stupid question. Um, so I, I love that piece, like being courageous enough to have the conversations, um, to ask the questions, because otherwise you do, like you say, people just stay stuck. And, and to become an entrepreneur, like you said earlier, like you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important for people to hear that. Do you have anything mm -hmm. you want to add to that? So much. <laughs> awesome. Brilliant. I feel like, so I also play a little game. Like I'll meet people in, in their later years in life and I'll say to them, um, you know, oh, why do you do what you do? And it really saddens me a lot because often people I find that question quite confrontational and they'll say, well, I don't know, I just fell into it. Or I don't know, when I was at school, my mum said, go study this at uni. So I did it. And But like these are often people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and I'm like, wow, you didn't actually choose your life. Like you just went along and you're looking back and you're not even sure how you got here. And was that if you're more conscious around your decisions, 
is that a life that you would have chosen for yourself you know and so people will hear me say a lot there's not a day that goes by where I don't question my purpose just to check in am I there because the thing is once we start to achieve some level of success more and more opportunities come around and so it's easy to tap into the ego and be like oh yeah I'm going to do that I'm going to do that and suddenly you're doing everything for everyone else and you've lost yourself <laughs> and um you know and it's really important as we've been discussing that that can take you out of your flow state because you know and and uh take you away from the focus and so as soon as something might sound sexy I always go oh is that my ego or is that actually going to take me closer to what I'm trying to do is that going to keep me in service and, and something else that I want to touch on that you said was around um almost things making sense retrospectively you didn't say that but I'm saying that so the things that got you to where you were you made the courageous decision by the sounds of it to jump and say I'm going to start a nannying agency and it's only through that courage that you were like, I hate this, or oh, it's not working for me. But you were able to identify the pieces of it that were. And I look back now and I go, here's my trajectory. I was a horse riding instructor when I left school. I went into <laughs> conference and event management. Like, you know, I had a divorce, gave up drinking. Like, none of that really in isolation at all makes sense to where I am now, except when you piece it together retrospectively, it all makes perfect sense because the horse thing probably taught me about shoveling horse manure at 4 a.m., <laughs> taught me about resilience and getting gritty and getting my hands dirty. You know, the conference and event management probably taught me the part of it which I loved, which was the sponsorship, which was doing deals, taught me that I'm actually not very detail-orientated and I need detail-orientated people around me. The divorce taught me to choose better men no <laughs> but it taught me like a whole I mean that made me really go and look at like my neediness my abandonment issues like a whole lot of things from when I was a child that I didn't even realize were there and how they were playing out and how I needed to trust myself and believe in myself and not lean on someone else so like all of this stuff and I think this is really important like so often in life the adversity almost crushes us but actually when you look back on it it's like that that is the freaking gold that is the piece that builds us I think yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I could not agree with you more I feel like all the the best choices decisions and who I am today is all because of the adversity it's all because of the that choice point you know am I going to be the victim here or am I going to make you know I talk about imperfect action it's one of the things yeah. that I constantly say because with human design, we talk a lot about being in alignment. And I'll talk about people really need to understand the difference, especially in the spiritual world. There's this thing that kind of really irritates me is like, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. And I'm like, uh, no. Um, and I talk a lot about we have to get clear on what out of our comfort zone is and what, of, what out of alignment is, because they're two very different things. Out of our comfort zone, if we go to our touch, you know, um, get in contact or we, we meditate or we sort of put ourselves in our future self, we'll get there and we'll go, oh, that feels really good. That was worth that. If, we, if we're out of alignment and we tap into the future self, we'll be like, oh, well, that was a waste of energy. And oftentimes we actually just need to take the imperfect action, make the mistake um, and go, okay, cool. That's what out of alignment feels like versus out of our comfort zone. And I think it's something that's so oh. important that we all need to learn because we are... Um, energetically hardwired to be in a flow state all the time, except we have this thing called an unconscious mind. Mm. So, you know, unless we're the Dalai Lama, we are going to have to deal with that, that quandary. Is this my comfort zone or is this out of alignment? And we can have lots of clues, but sometimes we do just need to take that imperfect action and, and sort of discover it for ourselves. Um, do you want to, you just, do you want to respond to that? I just love everything. I feel like we could do a podcast on each topic. <laughs> I know. And I'm so conscious of your time as well. I'm like, okay, talk fast, Emma, talk fast. We can do an episode too. Yeah. Um, I think you articulated that perfectly. I mean, and I think it's such an important thing, right? Because you're absolutely right. There is, there has to be to achieve any level of success or moving forward or you know growth mindset there has to be 
undeniably a level of discomfort and you know the ability to push through um uh, yeah as opposed to this totally isn't my jam and why the hell am I trying to do this you know yeah, exactly. and um yeah so I think I think people learning to feel into those and not give up because it feels uncomfortable and learning to tune into both of those and we could probably both talk for a long time about different examples and how to do that and maybe that's a conversation for another day mm. but yeah super important because there is not a day that goes by where I don't feel some level of major discomfort yeah <laughs> like really and I just think, oh, okay, here we go. Like it's a lot of just problem solving and kind of going, okay, I want to push through this. And, you know, I've trained myself to do that. But if I just went, mm, that doesn't feel good, then nothing would ever happen, you know. Yeah. So I've tuned myself into like I'm tapping now, but like why doesn't that feel good? Like what? why doesn't that resonate? Does Am I out of alignment? Am I not in flow state? Okay, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm in tune with that. Yeah, that is not the right path. But then there is a very big difference. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I want to talk really quickly two more points. Um, I'm going to go to this one first because um, it's something really close to my heart and I think it's super important because the generations um, to come are the ones that are really, you know, we're creating the change. We're living in this time of chaos. Um, human design actually talks about this new paradigm. Um, you know, astrology talks about the, the age of Aquarius. Like we, we talk about this new time that we're moving towards. Mm. And that's why we're in this time of breaking down. We're breaking down the old themes and we're moving into this time that's going to be really amazing. Um, but through this process, of course, I mean, I'm a parent. I have a 15 year old and a 10 year old. I keep saying he's 11. He's not 11 yet. He keeps <laughs> reminding me. Um, and I once had, um, when my, my eldest was, he was at, um, at Redlands in private school and I was deciding whether or not to take him out because we, we were living in Balmain. He was going to private school over the bridge and the, his friends weren't sort of traveling back and forth. So we had to have this decision. Okay. And he's also a line force. So he has to have his friends. He has to have his people. Yeah. Um, so we had this, I was having this discussion. We either need to move over there or we have to move him schools over here. And at the end of the day, we decided we wanted to stay in Balmain. It was a culture that we wanted our kids to grow up in. And I remember having this conversation with a friend of mine who, um, one of Coop's best friend's parents who became good friends of mine. And she was, a, she's a venture capitalist. And I said to her, like, do you think it's going to be um, of detriment to take him out of a private school and put him in a public school? Mm. And she said to me, you know what, Emma? No because the only skills kids need in the future and this generation are entrepreneurial skills because it's the way of the future. So if they can get along with people and solve problems, they're much, they're going to be much better off than being placed in ways in schools that are telling them how to think. Ooh. So from that, that sort of point of view, what advice would you give to, to parents? Like I know that I'm really conscious about, they can go and, and my youngest has now decided he wants to be a doctor. So it's, you know, potentially that is the university road. Mm. But what are the sort of skills do you think entrepreneurs or parents of potential entrepreneurs could be sort of starting to introduce into everyday life with their kids? Mm, I love this conversation. So as you know, I'm actually launching Collective Hub Kids in November this year because it's something that I'm super, super, super passionate about. Um, and you know, it's just gone out of my head, but we've been living in Austin in Texas for the last few months. And I got out of Texas for a little while for many reasons. <laughs> There's a lot going on over there. But there is this extraordinary school. You can put it in the show notes because I can't think of it right now. But um, but I was told about it by some parents over there. And basically, it's an, it's an entire entrepreneurial school. And it has um, kids from, um, say, four different grades who are given together a six-week project, which is all about problem solving it's annoying me oh that my I, can't God, think of it I love that yeah so I bought the founder's book online the other day and I will I promise I'll put it into the show notes because I was fascinated and um something that this woman said to me about this school as well is that they're now being started by entrepreneurs all over the world. And the beautiful thing is, because I was like, you know, we're getting closer to being parents, God willing. Um, 
I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like in my later years. Do I want my child to be tied to one school for the next 18 years? But the beautiful thing about this because of the entrepreneurial nature is you can move them between schools in countries and they really, it's, um, they adapt and it's amazing. The skills, I think, I mean, I think I first started looking at this with Sir Ken Robertson. He did two TED Talks on this. I love him. Yeah, and he talks a lot about convergent versus divergent education, and that's what really resonated with me first off. And I think this largely forms the basis of where things are going in terms of curriculums in schools and universities. I think it's not any longer um, you know, it's not a one size fits all. You know, kids, when I was at school, I mean, I, because I kept asking, but how, but how, but why, but why, I was always outside the classroom. I remember my maths coach, Mr. Kamarami, I don't know how I still remember his name, other than he literally picked me up one day whilst I was still sitting on my chair carried me outside, put me down and closed the door. So I spent more time outside of the classroom. Same with, I did guitar lessons in a class for a term or I don't even know how long. All I remember is the green carpet on the stairs outside guitar because I was always told, get out. So I think and I hope that the school system is changing. And certainly the university system is where it's much more becoming around not doing a three or four year degree, but actually picking and choosing the subjects that interest you and that, you know, you can create your own journey. The thing is, there are jobs that we don't even know what they'll be, what the exactly. future looks like, that don't even exist yet. So I think we need to be teaching our kids a lot more of, you know, real life, you know, actual examples. I mean, have you ever used algebra or a, I don't even know, like a. So it's, <laughs> it's so funny you even say that. So my husband, yes, he uses, uses pi algebra. all the oh, time. I and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. man, what are you, and we actually, funnily enough, I used to have horses as well. And where I kept yeah. my horses at one point, there was a maths teacher and he took such pride in saying, do you know I actually use pie at least once a week? I'm like, I mean, you're, the, you're the anomaly, babe. I'm sure there's jobs that use pie, but I mean, that would be on the slender side of yeah. things these days. I, I totally say. agree. I feel like, um, I mean, and it's no secret, right? Like at school, I was a bit rebellious, but I probably taught myself to have street smarts and so I've gone on to do okay there were people like a billion times smarter than me they were book smart and they didn't necessarily do much with their lives because they didn't have the grit and that peace that is needed and I think we need to teach kids you know some resilience some grit some real life you know how do you get out of there and actually deal with real life problems and you know I think there's a lot of that innovation thinking differently problem solving um you know looking at gaps in the market just um being interested in different things places people spaces you know and this is great diversity and looking at different backgrounds and being unafraid to ask questions and no, no, no. I think we just need to teach that inquisitive mindset rather than Mm. squash it Oh my God. I love that. I love that. I often joke on the podcast, like one of the big things with our kids, because of course they're being raised within their design. Um, And one of the things is I always joke, like our kids have a seat at the table, you know, we have equal share at the table and sometimes Mm. it's a right pain in my ass, you know, (laughs) but at the same breath, like these are kids. um, We traveled around Australia last year with the caravan with the kids um, and they did distance education. And when they did their exit interview, um, to go back into school that they asked them all the questions and then they they sort of said well what didn't you like and what would you improve and both of my both of the kids had a list of things you know they're not afraid to say what they think yeah and I think that this is one of the things you know like um, I totally agree that problem solving piece that ability to ask questions like one of the things I love um, with my kids is they're not afraid to say what they think and and even to the like my mum can be a little bit tricky sometimes and she can be a little bit manipulative and she might say one thing to the boys and um, something to else to us. And my boys will just call her out on it. You know, they're not afraid of authority. They're not afraid to say what they think. Um, you know, they're the first one to, you know, have a conversation with parents or ask someone in the, the, the street for help. And 
I think that just building those sort of uh, problem solving and the resiliency, like you say, is so Mm -hmm. incredibly powerful, so incredibly Mm -hmm. powerful. Well, I have like a ton more questions, but I really want to respect your time. Um, So I will let you go. I do want like a lot of the audience that listens are actually in the States, in the US. So you lucky buggers, you get, (laughs) you're going to get to see a lot more of Lisa um, and a lot of her products are now going to be available or available soon in the Mm. US, which is super exciting. Um, Indeed. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put all the ways you can um, get involved with Lisa, whether it's you'll be running a new startup smart soon too, won't you? I think so. I feel like after this cohort, we should do another one. So yeah, I think I definitely will do another cohort this year, but let's get you through success. Yeah, exactly. Look at me. I'm already like three steps ahead. Yes, that is in my design. Yes. Um, Well, yes, maybe we can do a, a special Emma cohort or something yeah yeah, yeah exactly how many people want to do it yeah, yeah. I love it I love it the other thing I just want to share with you about your design so I was jumping to the end and I want to come back to it that piece about you being constantly put outside the classroom um, one of the things that a lot of my community who have a similar configuration to you which is a defined Ajna have been literally set free because you guys are actually the ones that you're designed to ask questions I'm not actually designed to ask questions unless I'm responding to something your energy is designed to constantly be asking questions and it's questions for questions sake. It's like you say, it's the seeking. It's not even, yes, you also have a gate called um, the answers. So yes, there's this really prominent part of you that wants the answers, but your energy is designed just to ask questions all the time. And if teachers only knew that, if teachers only knew like, yeah, those three kids in class are actually the ones that are meant to ask all the questions because what they're doing is inspiring Mm -hmm. everyone else in the room to ask questions but they don't know what to ask until those kids ask the questions. So I just want you to know that, like, that's how you're designed. And um, that's the, that's, you know, the the world that we're moving towards will empower the kids that are designed to ask questions to ask them all. I love that. That's so powerful. Mm. And I think I just remember the school, I think it's called the Acton school. There you go. Acton school. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put it in the, um, Mm. My gosh, so much you've said has really resonated deeply. You are oh, well, a very powerful, amazing, intuitive, special woman. <laughs> so well, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And, you know, I know it sort of sounds like I'm going overboard, but I just want to say thank you again because the entrepreneurial journey can be so lonely. And one of the things that I love about the three of you that I've really felt like, even though you don't know me, I've just been following up. Well, Francisca, I worked with quite closely, but... Um, is that you guys wear your heart on your sleeve. You actually lead from kindness and compassion. And it's all about, um, we're all in this together. So, you know, I'm really grateful that you are out there doing what you do because you're doing it in a way that not only you make money, you succeed and you support other people to do that, but you're actually making a better world because you come from love and kindness and compassion. So thank you. (sighs) Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So special. So so welcome. (laughs) So thanks everyone for joining us today. We're going to put all of the details for Lisa in the show notes. Follow her on Instagram. She's freaking awesome. She's so authentic. Um, And, you know, one of the very few people that you can send a message and you will actually get a message back. So that's beautiful. (laughs) I love that. Um, We'll put our website, we'll links to products, everything you need and the Acton School in the show notes. So thanks everyone for being here. Thanks again, Lisa. And I will look forward to the next podcast. Bye for now. Thanks everyone for being here all the way to the end of the podcast. I hope you got lots of value out of it. I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Could I please ask that you share this podcast with friends if you found it valuable? And also, bonus points, could you leave a review for me as well on Apple? It would be greatly appreciated. If at any point you would like to be on the podcast or you've got questions that you'd like me to discuss on the podcast, by all means, get on my socials and DM me. Everything you need is there in the show notes. Have an awesome day. Bye for now.